Welcome to the show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alsena. For this segment of the show, I'm going to continue to talk about diseases of the pancreas. When I left off last week, I talked about chronic pancreatitis and all its major uh, complications and side effects and what have you. And uh, again, I want to point out uh, to you, this is, the, this is the pancreas right here, this elongated, oh, this is it right here, and it's located in the left mid part of the abdomen. And you could also find it on, right here underneath this complex of gastrointestinal organs, etc. Okay, now, the pancreas is extremely important as an organ for several reasons. Number one, the pancreas produces three very important hormones. That's the endocrine part of the pancreas. And there's the exocrine part of the pancreas. The endocrine part of the pancreas has three cells in it, the beta cells, alpha, and delta. The alpha cells in the pancreas is, the beta cell produces um, insulin. The alpha cell produces glucagon. And the delta cell produces something called somastatin, something of that lab. That, uh, I think that's how to pronounce it. Now, so that's the endocrine part. Of course, you know, we cannot survive without uh, insulin. And the beta cells are the cells that produce the insulin. Okay, now the exocrine part of the pancreas uh, produces a series of enzymes that are needed when we eat food such as protein, sugar, fat, what have you. They have to be digested. And in order for them to be digested, the exocrine part of the pancreas has to produce the certain hormones, I mean enzyme, I'm sorry, enzyme, to be dumped into the stomach in order to help digest the food. Now, I brought with me a list of the, the different enzymes that I've been talking about. I thought I would uh, read them up to you. Uh, tryptogen, trypsinogen, I'm sorry, trypsinogen is one of them. And then you have another enzyme that's called chemotrypsinogen. Then there's another enzyme called carboxypeptidase and phospholipase, sterol esterase. All these things are involved in the, uh, in the digestion of food. So when we eat, now you understand how important the pancreas is. So when people get themselves involved in different activities that can damage the pancreas, they really are doing a lot of damage to themselves. Now these enzymes, by the way, are made by, you could use them as medication because they're now made by men, mankind, men-made pharmaceutical agencies, I mean, companies make them. So when somebody has pancreatic insufficiency because of chronic pancreatitis, we physicians can prescribe these uh, uh, enzymes in pill form so that people can take them so as to replace the enzyme that the pancreas is no longer capable of producing. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about this. Now, the biggest subject that I wanted to talk about is the subject of pancreatic cancer. Of all these different diseases that I mentioned with the pancreas, and I'm going to wrap up the series, I hope, in this segment, cancer of the pancreas is the biggest one. And let me give you the start. In this uh, uh, last year, 2014, 46,420 people were diagnosed with cancer of the pancreas in the U.S. 39,590 people died of this of pancreatic cancer. Worldwide, in 2014, 250,000 folks were diagnosed with cancer of the pancreas, and 250,000 folks died of cancer of the pancreas. Okay, because very few people survive cancer of the pancreas. You say, well, what makes it so difficult? First of all, it's, what, are, what are the risk factors for cancer of the pancreas? The risk factors are obesity, uh, uh, tobacco smoking, uh, being black or minorities, other minorities, because pancreatic cancer is more common in black 
and my other minorities than it is in Caucasians and Asian. Okay, so those so genetic is one of course, obesity, cigarette smoking, and uh, alcohol abuse because that damages the pancreas and that can lead to cancer as well. So the list is quite long. Now, what makes pancreatic cancer such a difficult thing to, to cure is the following. I should say are the following. This is this organ, this is the pancreas. Look at how long it is. If one develops pancreatic cancer, the tail of the pancreas over here, the individual may not know anything because it takes a very long time for the symptoms here to appear because it's in the tail. If the person develops cancer of the pancreas in the middle of the pancreas, also it's very difficult to diagnose. However, if the cancer occurs in the head of the pancreas, it is easier to diagnose, which may make it easier to detect and, 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 and cure if that's possible because the cancer is at the head of the pancreas is going to cause occlusion of this network of vessels right here, causing bile to back up. So when people have cancer of the pancreas and the head of the pancreas, they're likely to become jaundiced because of obstruction of this network of vessels, of tubes that are there. This is bile from there. Okay, that's going to be occluded uh, because of the of the, the headed pancreas, see, it has close proximity to it, making it easier for it to be blocked. Once that happens, the blockage causes backup of bowel, which is, of course, yellow, and then the person will notice that he or she is becoming yellow, and then quickly that will alert he or she to go to seek medical help because pain, unfortunately, does develop but not necessarily in the very beginning of the process. So which means then the symptoms, and I'll get to, of course, is weight loss, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Those are the most common symptoms. And the signs, as I just mentioned, is jaundice, uh, elevated uh, liver function test, which I will be getting into shortly. Those are the first red flag that something is going wrong here. So then, of course, the patient will seek the help of a physician who would then begin the evaluation. Okay. How do we go about evaluating someone who presents with symptom that we suspect could be pancreatic cancer. Well, they're going to present with weight loss, uh, loss of appetite, I just mentioned, nausea, vomiting. Uh, then, so right away, you will begin an evaluation by taking the history, naturally examining the patient thoroughly, examine the eye. You might see yellowness in the sclera. You may not, depending where the cancer is located as I just mentioned before, and you may palpate a mass in the abdomen. Yes, you may palpate a mass in the abdomen, or you may not. Left upper part, left mid-abdomen, which is where the pancreas is located, you may palpate it, you may not. Clearly, you will do a complete blood count after your exam. You may discover that the patient is anemic. And the type of anemia that you may discover is what we call the hypoproliferative anemia, meaning that the bone marrow is not able to produce red blood cell sufficiently. So that's called hypoproliferative anemia. You could tell that by looking at the indices, the red blood cell indices, and if you know how to interpret them, and or better still, you will do reticulocyte count, because the reticulocyte count will categorize for you what form of anemia you're dealing with. And that then will lead you in the right direction without wasting time doing a whole bunch of unnecessary tests, costing, wasting a lot of time, a lot of money, 
But if you do something as simple as a reticulocyte count, what the reticulocyte, reticulocyte are, they are baby red blood cells. They be red blood cells. They get spilled into the circulation. That's correct. We, all of us, walk around with baby red blood cells that are not yet mature in our circulation. So you would take a sample of blood, you will put a drop of it on a, on a uh, clean glass slide, you will smear it out, and you will stain it with gum gymsa stain, dry that out, and then put a drop of oil on it, cover it up with a little, little cover glass, and put it under the microscope. And then you will count a hundred cell. That's correct. And then the amount of reticulocyte found in 100 cell under the microscope is the percentage of reticulocyte that you have in your bloodstream. That's how it's done. So because that will direct you in a direction because the workup for anemia can be quite extensive and quite expensive. So it is wasteful to be doing all these tests when you already know you have a hypoprolific anemia, so you will follow that line of thinking, which will then bring you to a conclusion as where what may be causing the anemia. Okay, I, I understand that's uh, difficult stuff, but really is not really, really isn't, because diagnosing somebody with anemia is not that difficult, but determining what type of anemia it is can be very difficult, and yet it doesn't have to be. Because if you do the reticulocyte count, it will direct you. Just like you're in the middle of the ocean, trying to find where you find where you're going to land, where you're going, and where your boat is going. Well, the, the reticulocyte will be your compass that will direct you so that you could get to the shore to get out of trouble. Okay. Now, so you would do that. The white blood cell count may be elevated, may not be, because all cancers are inflammatory in nature, so that can cause an elevated white blood cell count. Don't be fooled by that, thinking that you're dealing with an infection. You could, but not necessarily. You look at the platelet count. Well, the platelet count may be low, may be elevated, because again, cancer can cause high platelet count. Cancer can cause low platelet count. It is for you to have the sufficient clinical know-how to be able to discern what these things may or may not mean. Okay? And I'm not going to sit here and try to teach you how to do that. If you don't know it, well, I'm terribly sorry about that. Then you will do a complete blood chemistry profile. Now that's key. Very, very important. What are you looking for in your blood chemistry profile? Well, you're looking at the first thing, you want to take a look at your blood sugar. Because remember, I just told you that uh, the pancreas has two parts to it. The exocrine, the endocrine. Well, if you have cancer the pancreas, Depending on the extent of it, it may be something that could have affect the part of the pancreas where the uh, endocrine system is located. Don't know, but be careful. So you're going to look at the blood sugar, look at your electrolyte to make sure your kidney function is 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 is, is good. Because you need good you're going to need very good kidney functions if you're going to talk about treatment. Because if you have the better the kidney, the better the heart. The better the brain, the better the lungs, the better your chances of uh, doing well, it does, regardless what type of cancer it is, okay? Now, the test that you really want to concentrate on are the so-called liver function test. And what are those? Well, you have the bilirubin, both total, direct and indirect bilirubin. You take a look at the alkaline phosphate, it's very, very important. Especially if you're talking about blockage, a kind of phosphate is likely to be extremely high. Then you look at the SGOT, you look at the SGPT. Now, very important. You may, at the same time, since you suspect cancer, do lack LDH. You probably never heard LDH before. How do you come from cancer to LDH? Well, that's very important because uh, uh, the LDH has very, very significant meaning as we discussing uh, cancer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, but I, I won't get into that too because I don't want to confuse you. So, so you do these things, and they take a look at 
how abnormal they are. Sometimes in, the, in the beginning of the process, if the cancer is located in the tail or in the body of the pancreas, this test may be perfectly normal because there, there is no obstruction taking place. But you're still having the weight loss. You're still having all this sort of stuff. And your liver function test may be perfectly normal. If it's abnormal, that's easier to pick up and say, well, they're abnormal, let's do X, Y, and Z. But the fact that they're normal should not deter you from con proceeding with your evaluation. So now that you've done all that, you, know, you have a patient who's losing weight. You have a patient who uh, is having abdominal pain. You have a patient who's having nausea and vomiting, and a whole host of other insomnia, depression, you just name it. So you're going to proceed then to do two things. I would do an abdominal ultrasound and quickly proceed to do an abdominal CAT scan with, I, with oral and IV contrast. So this way, this way you don't miss anything. If you want to go the other way, then you could also do an MRI. The MRI will tell you the whole, the whole will show you the whole picture as well. What do what you expect the CAT scan to show you? What well, the CAT scan of the abdomen, of course, the, the uh, <clears throat> ultrasound is very important because if there's something wrong with the, with the gallbladder, even though that's not what we're talking about now, it's better to do an ultrasound than it is to do a CAT scan. I have a reason for saying that, but I'm not, again, going to detail that for you. Suffice it to say, get your CAT scan, and your radiologist is going to call you that, that you have a mass there. Okay, fine. So now you're getting somewhere. Now you're getting somewhere. As soon as you hear that, the next thing, of course, is to talk to the patient, the family, let them know there's a mass. What do you do? Well, you call your gastroenterologist. They are, they are gastroenterologists who specialize in certain aspects of gastroenterology. Namely, these are people who have the training to do something called ERCP. These are people who have training to do endoscopic ultrasound, whereby they can actually go in, they actually see the pancreas, that's correct. They can go to this area, believe it or not, with their scope, and they can take specimen. They can take specimen, okay? Now, that's one way to go. If you have a mass, that's documented the mass, Nowadays, with this incredible technology of this very superb uh, radiologist who subspecialize in, 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 in invasive procedure, okay, so they can actually go there with a tiny little needle on the CAT scan visualization, take a little piece of tissue from the mass. Then you bypass all these other stuff that I just told you about. You can go right for the mass. Okay, interventional radiologists. Uh, I, I, I sit here with memory when I was in training at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. There's a doctor there. I don't know where Dr. Spurigan is his name. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me mentioning his name. Who well, basically, to my mind, is really the father of the field of interventional radiology, because he was the one starting it out at Montefiore, teaching everybody how to do it. And many of the people that I work with now in the hospital were taught by Dr. Spur again. I don't know where, we, we call him Spur, we don't know where he is right now, maybe he's retired. And, and this field now has evolved into a huge deal, huge deal. And these gentlemen and women can go in there and get into any place in the human body with the little, tiniest little, because all we need is a tiny little um, piece of tissue. And then that tissue then will be sent to, will prep properly and then sent to the pathologist to be evaluated. And then in a matter of three, four days, you'll have a diagnosis. Is it or is it not cancer? If it is cancer, and then, of course, now you need to bring in your surgeon who does GI surgery or general surgery, who is very familiar with that kind of stuff, then to determine what to do. 
I'm not a surgeon, but these surgeons are absolutely fantastic at what they do, especially those who, the, the surgeon who do general surgery, but there are those who do, do specifically with GI type uh, malignancies, etc. And they can go ahead and decide what to do, what kind of um, surgery they're going, surgical procedure they're going to carry out. And I am going to stop the discussion right here because I'm not a surgeon and I don't deal with, with surgery. But I have a very good idea of what they might or might not do okay, to try to take care of this, this pancreatic mass. So therefore, then cancer of the pancreas is, is very common. It's a brutal type of cancer, very bad cancer. Very few people actually survive cancer of the pancreas. Now, while I'm talking about cancer of the pancreas, another cause that should be mentioned, of course, is poverty. How do you go from poverty to cancer of the pancreas? Well, diet plays a major role, as we know it, in the development of cancer of the pancreas. In this country, you have an epidemic of obesity. Two-thirds of the U.S. population is slash obese slash overweight. The U.S. has more obese individuals than any other developed country in the world. And yet, of all the developed countries in the world, the rate of poverty is highest in the U.S. And yet, the U.S., to the best of my knowledge, is the wealthiest developed country in the world. You go figure that out. An article just came out uh, earlier today that I got it on my uh, AMA website, and I will read it to you. When I say to you poverty, you understand what I'm talking about. This article talks about the fact that the life expectancy in the U.S. has decreased to 78.8. It used to be 80 point something in the 1970s. And of the 34 con countries that were evaluated, the U.S. is 27. I mean, that's crazy, 27 of the 24 countries, 34 countries. This is how bad things really are in the U.S. as it relates to poverty. And the article talks about the highest obesity rate, in, which is in the U.S., a uh, weak public health sector in the U.S., millions of uninsured Americans. I must stay here, however, that the Obamacare has already insured more than 17 million people. In spite of all the resistance President Obama got and all the flack that he got from the Republicans, 17 million folks have already been insured by Obamacare. How can anyone, how can anyone with any level of decency argue against something like that? And the saddest thing about these people who are talking from both sides of the mouth, they don't know anything about health care. They just talk because talk is cheap. They're not physicians. They're not practicing medicine. They have nothing to do in terms of providing health care. And yet, they, will, they just want to destroy it because it is every single thing that President Obama says, they have a counter argument against it because he's the one who says it. And the reason is obvious, because he's a black man. They don't like the fact that he's president and they're trying to destroy his presidency. They're not succeeding because he's a very bright, intelligent, brilliant man with a good support team around him, and he's doing great things. Here it's mentioned income inequality. Income inequality. Illegal drug, u drug use, traffic accident, and homicide. This is, this, is, this, is, this is what causing all this major problem in the U.S. A country this rich should not allow this kind of stuff to go on. I mean, how do you justify the top 2% holding $45 trillion I, the last time I, I read about it? It's ridiculous. What can they possibly do with that money while their fellow Americans are suffering? You got millions of kids going to bed every night with nothing to eat. 
And of course, I'm not here to pontificate, but I'm here to remind folks that I was excessively poor. I suffered the indignities of poverty. It's not a disgrace, but it affects your health, which is the biggest thing that you have is your health. Because if you have no health, no matter what else you have, you have nothing. And this country has done a lot for me, but I just didn't sit there and they gave it to me. When I came to this country, I finally realized that I worked so hard to get here. And the thing that I wanted the most is an education. That's all I wanted. I wanted to be freed from the, from the shackle of ignorance. That's why I fought so hard to get here, because I know that was the only chance I had left, because I missed my first chance. Because when they took me out of school when I was seven, after the death of my mother, that was my first chance. I missed that. And I wanted a second chance. So the U.S. gave it to me. And I took full advantage of it. So to improve your status in this, as it relates to economic situation, you have got to go to school. You've got to do it. That's the surest, truest, honest way to get ahead. You go to school, get yourself an education, get your, I never planned to be a doctor. I had no idea what this was all about. I was just going to school to try to get an education. It's in the process of getting an education that I realized, oh my God, I'm really good at this biology stuff. I'm really good at that chemistry stuff. So, and I wind up, I knew I was an intelligent guy. I knew that, that I knew is for sure. That was my only gift. That's the only thing I had to go on. But I never planned to be a physician. It just happened that way, that I followed the, that track. And here I am, a full professor, an MACP, and I've written 22 books. So if I do it, so can you. Listen, that's my spiel about diseases of the pancreas, chemotherapy, radiothera radiotherapy, I also use for treatment. Until I see you again, this is Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye-bye.